Hello listeners, uh, we're here at the Lew Institute for Global Issues at Uni University of British Columbia and we're going to be talking with uh, Maloon Kathari. Maloon is a prominent international voice on human rights, especially economic, social and cultural rights. Ms. Kathari is an outspoken critic of the countries and institutions that see the neoliberal and military security policies as a means to achieving democracy and human rights. Formerly UN Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing from 2000 to 2008. He is also the convener of the Habitat International Coalition's Housing and Land Rights Network and a founding member of the International NGO Committee on Human Rights in Trade and Investment. He has also been actively involved in works related to the human rights dimension on poverty, water and sanitation. In his work as Rapporteur, he is also focused on strategies to ensure respect for human rights in post-conflict and post-disaster situations. Maloon Kathari is the author of the 2007 UN Human Rights Council Report on Adequate Housing in Canada. Welcome, Maloon. Thanks very much. We are uh, curious to find out what led you as an architect into caring about the homelessness and caring about housing policy. Well, I was of course uh, concerned with housing and human settlements issues uh, while studying architecture and practicing as an architect. And I realized that continuing to practice as an architect, that architecture was a very elite profession and I was inclined towards doing more work on social issues. And that's what brought me to uh, the human rights dimensions of housing and looking at uh, housing as a, as a social good uh, rather than a commodity, as is very, of, very often viewed by professionals. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the right to adequate housing? Well, the right to adequate housing uh, has been, is an internationally recognized right since the adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And subsequent to that, the work that has been done um, using international experience uh, shows that it's a, very, uh, it's a very broad right. It includes access to water, electricity, sanitation, it includes protection against displacement, uh, it has dimensions on women's rights to land, property, inheritance uh, and housing. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's it, I think we have to think of it as a right to a secure place to live. So it's much more than just shelter. It's actually a, it, it's a, it's, it's, it's a right that, that uh, is essential uh, to have a life with security and dignity. So are slums considered housing? Well, they are a form of housing, but they're, they would be considered inadequate. And I've used the term distress housing. Uh, these are not ideal by any means. And uh, there's, a, there's a very urgent need to change the conditions in slums around the world, uh, which are, slums are you know, growing as a phenomenon. Um, um, we're curious to find out what findings from your 2007 survey of the right to adequate housing in Canada surprised you. What are our key challenges? What issues from a global perspective remain regarding the implementation of the human right to adequate housing? Well, many, many issues surprised me. First of all, I was surprised that um, the right to adequate housing, along with other economic, social and cultural rights, health, uh, food, employment, are not recognized as fundamental rights in, in Canadian law, uh, either in the Charter or in provincial legislation. Uh, that was a big surprise to me. But what really um, struck me when I was visiting the country was, why is it that in such a wealthy country uh, you have such high levels of homelessness, uh, such high levels of you know, the number of people living in inadequate and insecure housing, uh, why you have such problems of child poverty, range of different issues and, and I was also particularly shocked by the conditions in which the Aboriginal, the, the native Canadians uh, are living across the country uh, and the levels of you know, uh, dispossession and violence that they are subjected to and, and, and I was surprised by the, the continued uh, paternalistic uh, attitude of the, uh, of the governments um, towards, towards the indigenous. So, so, so I think mostly it was um, it, it always strikes me when I visit, uh, you know, so-called developed countries where there is so much wealth and, 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 and not such high populations that it, you know, it strikes me that it would take very little of that wealth to ensure that everyone has a right to adequate housing. But I think that what has happened in Canada as, as 
has been happening for many decades in uh, in the United States, certainly, but also in other country countries like Australia and some of the Western European countries, has been a sort of a wholesale adoption of neoliberal economic policies, which have taken away from the earlier good track record that Canada had in providing social housing, in building social housing, in providing housing options, in providing sufficient subsidies. And there's been a, a very systematic um, dismantling of those uh, mechanisms and programs. And that's why we see uh, such high levels of, I mean, what the United Nations at one point called a, a national emergency, and I very much confirmed that in my report. We are here in Vancouver today, and uh, we know that we have the highest rate of child poverty mm -hmm. in Canada. Um, what are some of the recommendations coming out of the report that might help our community here? Well, I think uh, generally the recommendation in the report was that while there are you know, different policies, there, there's nothing actually binding them together. So what I really called for is for there to be a, a national housing strategy um, backed up by specific strategies that would look at the specific problems that, uh, that women face, that children face, that the youth face in Canada. Uh, and, and unless there is that kind of a, you know, a national binding policy which commits funding from both the federal and the provincial level, um, we're going to continue to see the kind of you know, disparate and efforts that are being made. And I, and I think that um, uh, the, the other recommendation in the report of, report, of course, is that there has to be a, um, a human rights-based approach. So we, it, this, this uh, obsession that governments have gotten into to let the market take care of housing and other needs uh, has to be overcome and, and there has to be a much more uh, progressive intervention of the government and even where the market functions uh, the recommendation is that there has to be regulation there has to be control and, and it's absurd the kind of speculation that you see in what million dollar condominiums in Vancouver and other areas because what, what that does and that we point that out in the report is it, it not only makes it difficult for lower income people to find a secure place to live, uh, affordable place to live, but also for the middle class and you know certain sections of the upper middle class. So there's a, uh, I, I think the approach has been very chaotic and very dis very destructive. So the report calls for a for a complete uh, overall overhaul of the of the uh, housing policies and related policies. Yeah. We have an opportunity here in Vancouver as we're recording this. We're uh, coming into a major international event. That's right. uh, the Winter Olympics ga Games are coming here in February 2010. And I'm wondering, um, in your experience, whether these types of events create opportunities for establishing housing policies um, internationally or, or, for example, here in Canada. Um, we have promised the uh, global community that uh, we will improve our social housing uh, conditions here in Vancouver. And I'm wondering, if you have seen this as a success in, in other places in the world? No, quite to the contrary. I think the, the historic experience with global events, um, Olympics and so forth, um, has been that it has been detrimental to the rights of poor people uh, in, in the cities in which these uh, events have taken place. Uh, speculation has increased, ghettoization has increased, uh, there has been an increase in homelessness, uh, and in spite of the, you know, Sort of sustainability and you know other social commitments made by governments um, when they are making a bid for the games. I mean, if you look at if you look at the the cities in which Olympic games have taken place in the last you know 20, 30 years, the legacy has not been very positive at all for the poor. And it's not different in Vancouver. In fact, since the games were announced, um, you know when you look at statistics, when you visit different neighborhoods in the city, you see that homelessness has increased, poverty has increased, more and more people have been evicted from um, SROs and you know, other, um, other places where they lived. Um, and, and in fact, um, there has been increasing, increasing speculation, so the affordability question has not gone away. Uh, so I, I think that the, the Vancouver certainly had a very good chance to use that um, spotlight and to use the funding that was being you know, that was being uh, brought in because of the games to improve um, social conditions, but I don't see that uh, that has not happened.